Hey guys, they don't make movies like they used to. The one thing I miss about classic movies is the soundtrack. I think without music, a lot of the movies we value highly wouldn't be so great. For example, Harry Potter, Jurassic Park, Star Wars, A Bridge Too Far, Indiana Jones. These movies all have iconic soundtracks that are instantly recognizable. Not only do people know them when they hear them, but these soundtracks are also suited to these particular films in ways that are hard to describe. Today, I want to explain why the main theme from The Godfather is one of the best pieces written for a movie both in structure and in mood. Before I get to the music, I want to address the key it's in. C minor is a key that is most easily described as desperate. Some of the most desperate and depressing pieces in the classical repertoire are in C minor, such as this piece by Chopin from when he found out his home country of Poland lost a revolutionary war against the Russians. C minor is also used in Beethoven's Pathetique Sonata, which helps give the sonata a helpless, frantic feeling. C minor is also used in the opening movement of Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, which helps give the piece its depressing feeling when it returns down to the depths of C minor. As a precursor, the chords you see above the notes are strictly the chords of the left hand. The notes within these chords are up for interpretation because the actual piece is not played strictly on piano. I chose the accompaniment to the melody based on what I thought sounded best, but what I chose isn't in the score so I won't be basing my analysis off of it. In The Godfather, the musical director Nino Rota wrote the famous love theme with the feel of a requiem. More precisely, he wrote this piece with a very stagnant slow feeling. Take the first three notes. These notes not only establish the key of the song as C minor, but they also establish the pacing. The entire piece is quarter notes. Let's play it from the beginning again. This theme right here places the second of the chord on the main beat creating a suspended feeling. This suspended feeling will move heaven and earth to resolve to C, which it does on the very next beat. Afterwards, this phrase ends on G, the fifth of the C minor chord. The next phrase starts in C minor again, but the root of the third measure changes from C to E flat. It then resolves to F minor. This C to E flat in the left hand is a bit of counterpoint and helps to give this phrase tendency towards the fourth of the chord, F minor. These four measures also draw parallels to the first four measures. These next four measures have both the D diminished chord and the tonic C minor chord respectively. These chords function well together because both the tritones and the diminished chords resolve well into the C minor chord. For example, the FB tritone resolves to E flat and C, while the D and A flat tritone resolves to E flat and G. The combination of these results in C minor, therefore the D diminished chord carries a tendency towards C minor. The final phrase of this section is like a recap of the past 12 measures. It's a common 2-5-1 progression, but an interesting phenomenon here is the ending of these phrases. The first four measures end with a G, the second four measures end with an F, and these last four measures end on a C, which is lower, and because it's a tonic and it's slower than the previous two phrases, it marks the resolution of the melody and the end of this musical idea. The following musical idea is an E flat major, the relative major of C minor, but first, Nino Rota transitions from C minor to B flat major 7. Personally, I find that when you move to a major key in a sad song, it always feels more major, and this is definitely the case with this song. This phrase starts with C to C flat to B flat, which acts somewhat as a transition to the sweeter melody of this middle section. 
Then the next measure has a D to C to A flat, followed by G in the following measure. Two things. The D and A flat form a tritone within the B flat 7 chord. The A flat and the D resolve to G and E flat. Also, the melody's pitch sequence goes small jump, big jump, to small jump again. The two small jumps, in my view, are reflections of each other. Both of these musical ideas help influence the melody. These next four measures are very challenging to explain musically. First, the melody of both of these phrases alludes to these phrases in the C minor section we heard earlier. This way, when we enter the mysticism of these strange chords, there is something familiar the listener can hold on to. The first chord of this sequence is the D-flat major chord, which is the Phrygian second chord, which means it's a major chord built on the minor second of a minor tonic, which for us is C minor. The relationship between the D-flat major and C minor, albeit a strange relationship, has been echoed by classical works such as Chopin's first ballade, which starts in an A-flat major chord even though it's in G minor. In the left hand, it goes from a D-flat major chord over D-flat, to a D minor dominant 7 flat 5 over F, to a G dominant 7 over G. The root goes from D-flat to F to G, which echoes the root of the earlier phrase going from C to E-flat to F. Not only that, but the D to G to C is another 2-5-1 progression that gets us back to C minor. Now that we got past the major part, by contrast, this minor part, even though it's just a repeat of the same minor section we heard earlier, sounds even sadder by contrast. Anyways, thanks for watching this video. I would really like to make more music videos in the future. Bye everyone.